Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. I want to say hi to our in-person crew at RC Theaters. Is anyone fired up to be here today? I also want to welcome our many friends wherever you're watching from online. We're so glad that you chose to join us. If you're a first-time guest at either of our places or presences, we are so fired up that you showed up today. We hope to see you again. My name's Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Hey, we're going to start with why today's message might be really important for every single one of us, regardless of our response to Jesus, because it's about the truth that we're going to talk about today that I'm going to put up on the screen, and it's this truth that we all have experienced. Between family dysfunction, personal defects, and damage from the world, we're all, all of us, you, me, we, we're all set up for relational calamity. See, you already know this, right? Listen, no matter how good your family is, right, or no matter how broken your family is, every family has dysfunction. Maybe I can get an amen from the audience or in the chat, type in amen. Every family has dysfunction. And listen, at South Point, we say there are no perfect people. That's why everyone is loved and welcome. Listen, everyone myself included, has personal defects, right? And listen, we've all experienced damage for the world. And so between dysfunction, defects, and damage, we are set up, all of us, regardless of whether we have no faith, different faith, or we've been a follower of Jesus all of our lives, we're all set up for relational calamity. This is why families are such a circus. Now, here's the thing. I'm not telling you something you don't know. Whether you're here or online, listen, you already know this. Here's the part that we know, but will rarely ever say out loud. And it's this truth right here. These things do not fix themselves. Our dysfunction, our defects, and our damage don't fix themselves. That's why we're in week two of a series called My Family Circus. There is no such thing as normal. And last week, listen, last week we admitted a hard truth that we're going to put up on the screen, and it's this right here. It's hard to win at life when we lose with family, right? Like it's really hard to win at life when you're losing with family. I mean, think about this. There's nothing that can replace your relationship with family, right? Listen, you get this. It doesn't matter how much money you have. If you have a broken and fractured relationship with your children, money cannot replace that reality. It doesn't matter how many awards or accolades or accomplishments that you get at work, right? If your marriage is falling apart, it doesn't matter because you're not really winning at life if you're losing at home. Listen, you can have a nice house and a nice car and a nice boat, right? But listen, when you go to Thanksgiving or Christmas with your family and you and your brother and sisters or your siblings or your aunt and uncles, your grandparents, and you're not speaking to each other or you won't even go, you know and I know it's hard to win at life when we lose with family and there is no substitute for it. And last week we uncovered this core flawed expectation that every family has. And we're going to put it up on the screen. It's this. They're supposed to and they'll understand. Because we get it, right? Like listen, being a part of a family doesn't lower the bar. It raises the bar. And so they're supposed to give me more. They're my family, right? So they're supposed to give more. And they'll understand because they're family, they should get less. But if that's my expectation and that's my my other family's expectation, you can see how this leads to pain and disappointment. Now, the good news is, is whether you're online or in person and you happen to miss this, you can go onto our website or you can go on our YouTube channel and anytime on demand, you can watch last week's message. Now, Back to the problem that all of us have, right, which I'm going to put up on the screen, and it's this, right? Like we have family dysfunction, we have personal defects, and, and life has damaged us. Now, I want to stop here for a second and go, listen, as a pastor and as a human being, I've experienced all these, a ton of them, right? Like as I was going through kind of my family, my biological family, and looking at my mom's side and my dad's side, man, there's so much brokenness. As I look at my own life and my personal defects, I go, man, I've, I've, I have a lot of things, man. I always tell people, I'm busted and broken just like everyone else. I need Jesus. And listen, I've experienced a lot of life's damage. And between the dysfunction, defects, and damage, if they go unaddressed, will create pain and fractures and friction that no one wants. 
to kind of put this in a story form, it was about 10 years ago. I had to go to a family funeral. If you've ever gone to a family funeral, especially of an older family member, uh, it was sad, but there was a lot of beauty about this life that was well lived. But when you get all the family together, there's also a lot of dysfunction. Can I get right? Like maybe you want to type that in the chat. Maybe you just, you're smiling because you go, listen, uh, you know, when you get a family together over like a loss like that, there's some sadness, but there's some joy of a great life lived, but there's also a lot of dysfunction. So we were out of town. We were with our extended family, our whole family together. We were there for about a week and I forget where we were in this, uh, but we as a family were going to a place and my sister, she had had a baby and so she had her baby with her. She put the baby in the car seat. She was getting in the car and I had an extended family member right? Who who was getting into car to drive. And my sister grabbed me quietly and whispered in my ear. He says, hey, this family member who's got the keys, who's about to drive is an alcoholic. They've been drinking. I smell alcohol. Please confront them. Do not let them drive me and my child and the family around while they've been drinking because it could be catastrophic. And so in the middle of this like family devastation, we're like, we're talking about being at a funeral and and my sister with her newborn babe and kind of all this thing. I, I have to go to this family member and I have to say, hey, listen, you can't drive if you've been drinking. And they got mad and it created all kinds of dysfunction. And it was just, it was just painful. My family circus. There is no such thing as normal. And this family member, they love me. They love my sister and we love them. And this person believes in God, knows God, knows a lot about Jesus in the Bible. But here's the truth that they missed. Family dysfunction, personal defects, and life damage will not fix itself. And so listen, whether you're here in the in-person audience, maybe you got tired and you're already scrolling. I want to ask you to stop. And if you're at home and the kids are distracting or you're about to get a cup of coffee, I want you to lean in because here's a truth that's so important. And we're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this right here. We're either going to face the pain of our flaws, our dysfunction, our defects, and our damage, and the pain of our flaws, or we're going to experience the pain of ignoring them. Listen, you get it, and I get it, right? Listen, we can either face the pain of our dysfunction, the pain of our defects, and the pain of our damage, and that's not fun. Nobody goes, woo, that's what I want to do today, right? Like, I get it. It's not fun, right? Or... We're going to experience the pain of ignoring them. We can ignore them. And here's the deal. And you know this and I know this. Like, it's, so, it's not complicated. It's not rocket scientist. Listen, we can either have the short-term pain of facing those things or we can experience the long-term pain and consequences of ignoring them. And here's the reality about our family dysfunction, our personal defects, and the damage that we receive from life is it will bring pain one way or the other. We're just all going to make a choice. Either we're going to choose to face it or we're going to choose to ignore it. And it leaves us asking today one of life's most important questions. How do we deal with this dysfunction? How do we deal with these defects? How do we deal with this damage in a way that we can win with our families so that we can win in life? Because my bet today is you didn't show up today online or in person so that you could lose. And one of the things that makes it hard to win at life if you're not winning with your family. And this is where there is some amazing news this morning. It's the news that makes me fired up. It is why I am all in as a follower of Jesus and I love God and I love the Bible. Matter of fact, God knew that every single one of us throughout all of time since the beginning would struggle with this problem and the answer to this problem of how do we deal with our family dysfunction, our personal defects and the damage isn't rocket science and isn't complicated. Matter of fact, the answer is the best news in all of human history. And I get to share with you this morning. I'm so fired up. Now, before I share this best news in human history, though, it would be helpful if I shared some context around the scripture that we're going to look at. Now, you need to understand, this is a letter written by a guy named Paul. Now, this guy named Paul, he used to not like Jesus, and he used to hate Jesus followers. Matter of fact, this guy named Paul hated Jesus followers so bad that he went from city to city to persecute them and even execute Christ followers until 
Paul encountered a risen Jesus. Then he became a Jesus follower. Instead of going from place to place to persecute and execute, he began to go place to place to create communities of Jesus followers. The word that we use today is churches. Churches aren't a building. They're just communities of followers of Jesus. And there was this one group of followers of Jesus in the city of Ephesus. And you might be going, Matt, what is Ephesus? An old Roman city that doesn't even exist anymore have to do with me today. And here's why I needed to set it up. Because as God speaks through Paul to this group of Christ followers at the city of Ephesus, they were a lot like the community at South Point today, whether in person or or online. You see, in the city of Ephesus, there were Jesus followers who had grown up with no faith all their life until they surrendered and said yes to Jesus. You have to understand, in this port city of Ephesus, there were people who grew up with different religion or pagan religions before they said yes and surrendered to Jesus. And in this group, there were some people who had grown up Jewish and had kind of had a relation with God since they were little kids. It was like us. It was a hodgepodge of all kinds of people and ethnicities and age and backgrounds. And God speaks to this group of Jesus follows the best news to deal with their family dysfunction, their defects, and the damage that life had given them. And we see this in this letter, Ephesians 1. And Paul starts off with a truth that's so important that we're going to look at today. And he says this, even before he, God, made the world, God, what? God loved us and chose us. Listen, I get it. Sometimes circumstances makes, makes us feel like God doesn't love us, but circumstances aren't the measure of God's love. Is The cross is the measure of God's love. That's why we say anyone that would die for you is for you. Even before God made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ. That's the important point. In Jesus, he chose us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now this word holy has been kind of messed up through kind of culture. Holy simply means to be set apart and to be used for what it was made to be. So holy just simply means we become God's children, the very thing we're meant to do, and then we live life as it's meant to do without fault. And so you might be asking a question that I asked, and it's one of the reasons that I stiff-armed Jesus for so long. I said, there's no way a God could love me. Because if he's really God, then he sees the true me. He sees all my dysfunction. He sees all my defects. And he sees all my damage. And I don't even love myself. Right? I mean, if we're really honest, we, if we take a hard look at our family dysfunction and our defects and the damage, there are many of us that go, I can't even love myself. How could God love me? And it says that God loved us and chose us in Christ that he doesn't see what's wrong with us. He sees who we are meant to be. And what I love about this is that as he starts this letter to this group of people like us, he doesn't just stop there. He goes on to say this. I said, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. Listen, this is great news because it doesn't matter what our old family dysfunction is. We can surrender and be adopted into God's family, his own family, by bringing us to himself through Jesus. Jesus is the answer, Jesus Christ. And this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. See, for many of us who have experienced dysfunction, for many of us who know our defects, for many of us who have experienced the damage of the world, we believe that God is upset that God hates us, that God doesn't love us. But yet here's what this apostle Paul who's had an encounter with the risen Jesus, God is telling you that it gives him good pleasure that he wants to adopt you and I into his family so that our legacy and inheritance would be forever changed. So the Apostle Paul tells us God speaks to this crew of people right through this letter. But like he doesn't just finish there because that might be like, great, God loves me. God chose me. God wants me to be a part of his family. How do I actually deal with this dysfunction, the defects, and the damage? And I love how God gives us such a clear and easy. This isn't something complicated and for spiritual gurus. This is something that any everyday person can do. And he writes it to a crew of people like us. We find this in Ephesians 4, and he says this, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. You see, for many of us, we hope that we can show up and that God will just kind of wave his hand over us and all of our problems and all of our faults and all of our dysfunction and all of our defects and damage will just magically go away. But that's not how it works. God says, listen, throw off the old part of you that is crusty and busted and broken. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. He's saying, listen, when you say yes and you surrender to Jesus, God's very presence, his Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. But we understand this. Listen, you don't need me to tell you this. For love to be true love, it always requires a choice. God will never force us to deal with our dysfunction, our defects, or our damage. 
And he goes on to tell them, put on the new nature created to be like God. He says, listen, you're supposed to throw off your old family dysfunction. You're supposed to throw off your old defects. You're supposed to throw off the damage and you're supposed to put on the new family traits and be like Jesus. And listen, being like Jesus, here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus made it so very simple. You want to know what it looks like to be a part of the family of God? It's so simple, really so simple. Put God first in every area. Put God first. Like, it's just so simple. Put God first and then love other people the way that Jesus loved you. If you want to know what it means to be a part of the family of God, to put on the nature of God, just put God first in everything, right? And then love others the way Christ loved you. And so you see this pattern of we partner by throwing off and putting on, but God gives us his presence on the inside that will give us direction and power. It is a partnership to experience these new family traits. And so today what I want to do is I just want to give us three practical steps that each and every single one of us can take so we can begin to experience what it's like to win in life and to win with our families, what it looks like to actually partner with God. Now, I want to be honest. All three of these steps could be a message in themselves, but I figured you guys would leave if I went too long. So I'm just going to give you the little nuggets of those groups, right? Whether you're online or in person, we'll give you the little nuggets, right? And, but these are three practical things that we can do to begin to throw off the old and put on the new. And so here's what God tells us, and I just want to put this up on the screen, it's so important. Our adoption through Jesus, we don't get adopted because we are good enough. We don't get adopted because we were born in the right country or the color of our skin or because we get it right or because we jump through religious hoops. We are adopted because Jesus came and lived a perfect life and he paid our sin penalty for missing the mark on the cross and then he conquered hell and death. We are adopted into God's family through Jesus and it gives us a new family legacy and a new inheritance. You see, when we have family dysfunction, when we have defects and we experience damage, our inheritance is brokenness. Anyone tired of inheriting brokenness? right? It's like we didn't ask to be born into our family. We didn't ask for our defects and we didn't ask for the world to make us busted, but we end up with this inheritance. But when we're adopted into the family of God for free because of what Jesus did, we get a new family legacy and our inheritance is something different than the bustedness and the brokenness that the world wants to give you and I. And that is the best news in human history. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a look at these three practical ways that we can partner with God's presence on the inside to deal with our dysfunction, to deal with our defects, and to deal with the damage. And here's step number one, and I want to say something before I even put it up on the screen, is this is the hardest step, okay? So I just want to be honest, okay? Step number one is this, right here. Identify dysfunctions, defects, damage, because they won't... Listen, I... can we just be honest? I've never seen a problem fix itself. Like, listen, I'm not giving you rocket science. It's not like you show up today and go, whoa, Pastor Matt is telling me something divine and like, like awesome. I'm just telling you something you know. Listen, you know this. Problems do not fix themselves. And so I need, I need everyone to focus. This is such a powerful truth. Unaddressed problems create unnecessary pain. Let me say it one more time. Unaddressed problems will always cause unnecessary pain because those things will not fix themselves. And so we should either face the pain of dealing with our dysfunctions. And listen, I get it. One of the things that I learned early in life is, is what's called a family geneogram. It's where you look at your biological family that raised you and you say, hey, what about my great-grandparents? What about my grandparents? What about my mom and my dad? What about my uncles? What about my siblings? Like, and I want to put a couple positive things and then I want to put a couple of negative things and then I want to kind of talk about was there any immorality, adultery? Was, was there loss and trauma? Were there miscarriages? Was there suicide? Like, what was going on in life? And listen, I know about family dysfunctions. When I went through this list, there is abuse there is abandonment, there is addiction, there's immorality, there's all kinds of dysfunction in my family that I didn't ask for. But if I don't identify it, it's not going to fix itself. And if you're married, think about it. You want to know why marriage is so hard? Everyone's like, I don't know why marriage is so hard. I thought true love was supposed to fix everything. Well, it's because you got your dysfunctions, your defects, and your damage. You're married to someone who's got defect, dysfunction, defects, and damage. And you're like, no, we, we wonder why it's so hard. Well, because we have to address these things. And then defects. 
I got plenty of them. If you don't believe me as Pastor Matt, somebody came up to me the other day and was like talking to me. And I was like, man, if you just knew, just ask my family. Like, I need Jesus every day just like you do. Like, I have things in me that are broken. Things like selfishness. Things like I just want to control everything. Things like I'll just run over people to get the things done that I want to get done. I have some defects. We we all do. I I experienced physical and sexual abuse as a child. I know what dysfunction and defects and damage are. And they're not pretty to address. They're not pretty to look at. But I have a choice. I can either face the pain of these things or I'll experience the pain of pretending or ignoring that they're not there. I'm a homeowner. Someone lied to you when they said being a homeowner is awesome. They lied. You got to fix everything that breaks. You got to mow your own yard. Like, it's just a lot of work being a homeowner, right? So anyway, I have, I'm a homeowner, and, you know, this was years ago. But I don't know if you've ever done this. I was in uh, kind of our family living room, which we don't spend a lot of time in. We spend our time in another room um, where they're kind of, you know, like we all hang out. And I was in there for some reason, and I, I smelled something funky. You ever smell something funky in your house? Maybe you just want to type funky in the chat, right? So I thought maybe one of my kids had left some food on the ground. I thought maybe one of my cats had like yacked or caught a dead mouse because it was a little bit of a funky odor. So I went sniffing around. You ever done the sniff test and you're like, it's going around sniffing. And I was like, man, that doesn't smell good. But as I looked around, I couldn't find food. Like I couldn't find a dead animal. I couldn't find cat throw up. Like I was like, I don't know what this is. So I did what all good human beings, I went and got a can of Febreze. I was like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And I opened the windows a little bit. Like, that's going to solve the problem, right? So a couple days later, I was thinking, what about that funky smell? Did it go away? So I went back into the thing, and this time the funky smell was worse, right? See, you all already tracking. The funky smell was already worse. And so when you, I was doing the sniff, and then when you do that enough, you can kind of tell where it's the stinkiest part of the room and the least stinkiest part of the room. And the stinkiest part of the room was next to the fireplace. And I was looking in the fireplace. I was looking all around the fireplace. No cat yak, no dead animal, no food. I couldn't understand. So you know what I did? I went back to what I knew how to do. I grabbed the Febreze. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. And then opened the windows, right? And a couple of days later, I'm busy at work, and I finally came home and said, I wonder if that smell is gone. Because, you know, problems always fix themselves, right? So I go into the room, and before I can get into the room, I mean, as soon as I open the door to my house, man, it is just, the funk is just, and like, it's not like a little funk. It's not like bathroom funk. This is like a dead animal, like a rotting trash. Like, man, it about just knocked me over. And so at this point, I'm like, well, what do I do? And so like, I, I go in and I, 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 it's, I can tell it's coming right out of the fireplace. And so you have to understand, I live in an older home and this fireplace has a, a boiler underneath of it that uses the same flu. So I, I cleaned out the fireplace. I got rid of all the ashes. I, I literally wiped it down to going, is there like a dead animal there? Nope, no dead animal. So I got on the boiler. I pull out all these pipes and, and all the stove stuff. There's no dead animal in there. There's nothing dirty that would smell in there. So I go, well, I guess the last thing to do is go up on the roof. So I get a ladder, I go up on the roof and I look down. I looked down in the chimney and I really can't see anything. But I said, you know what? Maybe I should get a flashlight. So I went and got a flashlight and looked down and there was a dead squirrel frozen. Like it had died and it just was stiff and it was on the end of my flu. And so I was like, man, well, that's why it's stinking, right? And so like, I'm not going to touch a dead squirrel. Like I grew up in the hood. We didn't grow stuff. We went to 7-Eleven, okay? So, like, I'm not touching no dead squirrel. Some of y'all are like, man, mm, squirrel, I'm going to eat that dead thing. Nope, not me. Mm-mm. Not going to touch it. So I did what all good homeowners do. I called animal control, and they laughed at me. They were like, what are you, what are you doing? Is the animal alive? No, it's dead. It's great. We're going to hang up now. Click. And then so I'm like, well, what do I do? I'm not touching that dead animal. So I called like a chimney flue cleaning thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll come by. And they, re- they quoted me a ridiculous price. And at this time, you know, we were, we're just kind of average people. So I, didn't, I wasn't paying that price. Uh-uh. I said, I guess it's time for me to man up. So I went, you know, and this is how bad I am at homeowner stuff. Instead of like getting like a work glove, I went and got two like Target used bags and double bagged it, put on my hand. And then I went up through the flue, and if you've ever touched a dead, stiff squirrel that you can't get out, and you're like hearing it crack as you bring it through the flue, uh, oh yeah, it was horrible, horrible. And then I put it away, I threw it out in the trash, and here's the good news. I opened the windows, I sprayed some Febreze, and it smelled better the next day. Woo! Yes. Now, we're all laughing at how stupid I am, right? I want to ask you this question. Is your family dysfunction, are your defects... And you're damaged like that dead squirrel. And it's creating a stink and a funk in your family and in your life. 
and you are taking the Febreze of food. You're taking the Febreze of alcohol. You're taking the Febreze of pornography. You're taking the Febreze of money. You're taking the Febreze of stuff. You're taking the Febreze of illicit relationships. You're taking the Febreze of social media to get rid of that stink. But we haven't solved the... And the very first step is to identify it. Step number two. Apply the grace and truth of Jesus. This is so awesome. This is, this is, why would we ever look at our defects and our dysfunction and our damage? It's because Jesus, God chose us and God loved us. Here's the great news. It doesn't matter how much dysfunction you have. Can I get an amen? It doesn't matter how many defects you have. It doesn't matter the damage done to you. Before the world was created, you were chosen in Christ Jesus to be his son or daughter, not based on who you are, but instead on what God did on on the cross man God adopts us in and so we're free we're free to look at it because God's love isn't based on our dysfunction our defects and our damage so grace allows us the opportunity to look at it and what I love about Jesus is he's a truth teller so not only does it give us the freedom and the courage to face our dysfunction and our defects and our damage we know and we have truth to give us steps in the right direction to head to undo those things my girls are getting older. They're going to be out of the house soon. And, uh, you know, I can remember back to when my youngest daughter learned how to ride a bike. And we were, we were those parents. You ever meet those parents? Like, we had that bike. It was like a colored bike. It was really cool. It had the streamers off the handlebars, right? It was had the streamers, right? It had the little bell. And I'm telling you, she came walking down the driveway like she was a gladiator going into the Roman Colosseum. I mean, she had her princess helmet on, right? And it was just buckled and chin strap and had all the princesses on it, right? And then she had these big giant elbow pads. They were matching princess elbow pads because that's the only way you can ride a bike, right? With some matching gear, right? And she had these matching knee pads and she had closed toed shoes, right? She just walked down and the bike had training wheels and she got on that bike and she's like, we're gonna do this, dad. And at first she was a little bit scared. But when I explained the training wheels would keep the bike upright and that I would be running beside her she no longer was scared is because she knew that she was free to try to learn how to ride the bike because she had a support system and as we move the training wheels I love that invention whoever did that is you kind of move them up a little bit as they get to go so that if they start the wobble they can catch it but then when they when you're all the way done you take them all the way off and I can remember as she was learning how to ride the bike I was running beside her and she's like let me go dad you don't have to be next to me until she tried to make a turn and when you first learn how to ride a bike you're scared to go faster on a turn so you go too slow and then the bike falls over and then so like I had to tell the truth I said hey I know speed scares you but to be able to make the turn you have to have a little bit of speed and I taught her how to brake and she was free and courageous to learn to do something she didn't know how to do because she was loved and I was right there to catch her. And isn't that the most amazing news today that you and I, whether you're online or in person, could ever hear? Is that we have the freedom and the courage to face our dysfunctions. We have the freedom and the courage to admit our defects. We have the freedom and the courage to admit the damage done to us because we are loved and chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Our value isn't based on our performance, but on the purpose that God made us for. See, you and I have the freedom and grace and the courage of the truth of Jesus to apply to our dysfunction, to our, de our defects, and to our damage so that we can live changed lives. Here's the truth. Once you identify it, you have to begin to do something different. Listen, listen, you know this. To get different, you have to do Right? To get different, you actually have to do different. You can't do the same thing expecting different results. That's a form of insanity, right? Which leads me into step number three, which is concentrate on self instead of trying to control others. Woo, boy, I'm going to preach here. Y'all going to be mad. <laughs> right? Because come on, come on, come on. Like nobody likes us, right? You know what the common denominator in all your pain and all your failures is? You. You know what the common denominator in all my failures and all my pain? Me. And see, listen, becoming something different is a way better investment of our time and resources in the blame game. Because when you play the blame game, when I play the blame game, when we play the blame game, there are no winners. There are only losers. When I first started going to church when I was a young man, I was probably about 17, right? My adopted parents took me. And there was this one guy, this really nice guy. 
but we all ran from this nice guy. And he would always try to corner people because he realized people were running from him. And we weren't running from this really nice guy at church because he, could, he didn't know how to talk or because he had bad stories. But he had the trifecta. First of all, he was a close talker. Y'all met any close talker? Hey, listen, I'm about to face palm you. If you try to like get too close to me, like I'm old school, like, like I grew up in the hood. If you get in my bubble, I'm like, whoa, whoa, right? And so he was a close talker. He'd get up and he'd like be in your face, right? Like, oh, that's not too bad. But the problem was is he was a smoker and a coffee drinker. And he didn't have breath mints on Sunday. And so if you ever tried to talk to a close talker who smoked a cigarette and drank coffee at the same time, you're just like, whoa, whoa, bro. Like, man, you got to back on up, man. Or here's a breath mint. You got to pick one of the two. But he kept trying to corner us. And what he didn't realize is the problem wasn't that he needed to control us. The problem was he needed to address himself. And I wonder how many of us in our marriages... I wonder how many of us in our parenting, I wonder how many of us in our relationship with our extended family, our brothers and our sisters, our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents, we're trying to control people. And you know this and I know this. You can't control people. They're going to do what they want to do. God doesn't even choose to control people. The only thing that we should do is concentrate on ourselves. Because when we concentrate on ourselves, the energy and effort that we give actually gets a result, whereas controlling just creates harm. And so step number one is we have to identify what are the dysfunctions, what are the defects, and what has the damage been done so I know where it's causing harm in my life and in the life of the family that I love. And the second thing is I apply the grace and truth of Jesus. The grace to be able to face it because God loved me and chose me and it's okay, right? But I need the truth of Jesus to direct me. And thirdly, I need to not focus on what other people are doing. The only person that I can control is... Could you imagine a church folk stop trying to control the world and just worried about themselves? God, get an amen. Yeah, that's real popular today. I can see that. Okay. Anyway, if I was going to sum it all up, here's how I'd sum it up and it'd be like this. God's unconditional love in Jesus allows us to address our mess. The unconditional love in Jesus allows us to dress a mess so our family story is based on who we're meant to be, not what's wrong with us. That's the greatest news. The adoption, the unconditional love found in Jesus means we are not afraid and we can take the courage to address the mess so that our family story will have a different inheritance than the brokenness of dysfunction, the bustedness of defects, and the pain of damage. Because God loves us and he chose us before the very foundations of the world. As I land this plane, I want to tell a true story about my adopted mom and dad. Now listen, you need to understand, I love my biological mom and dad, but there was so much brokenness, so much abuse and abandonment and just just flawed, right? And I was homeless and my adopted mom and dad took me in and they showed me the love of Jesus For some reason, they heard the whisper of God's presence called the Holy Spirit to say to love that knucklehead. And as they adopted me into their family, my family traits began to change. The things that I grew up with, I now had a new identity in my adopted family. And my adopted family began to teach me things that were of different values like put God first, love Jesus, love others before. So there were some things that began to teach me. And I can tell you that my family, my marriage of 27 years that we celebrated last week, my wife should get a medal. Can I get an amen? Because I'm crazy, right? I have two daughters. Like, I have extended family. My family inheritance, my legacy is different because I was adopted into a new family. And that's exactly what God wants to do for you and for me and for we. But God, who's a God of love, will never force. It will always have to be a choice. So here are three challenges. Maybe sit down and take some time and do a little family geneogram where you kind of identify where's their brokenness. And if you're married, you really should do this because you'll begin to identify all those conflict points. Maybe for you, it's take a 20-minute walk and ask, hey God, what's the Febreze that's hurting myself and hurting those that I love? that I'm using just to cover up the dysfunction. And we have something at South Point called Celebrate Recovery. Maybe that would be a good start. For others of you, it might be a few minutes in a journal asking one simple question. Where 
has trauma caused me to live in such a way that hurts me and my family? Because God loved and chose us before the foundation of the world to adopt us into his family and to have new family traits so that we could win at life. Let me pray. God, you rock that you would choose us and love us way before, even though you would see all of our dysfunction and all of our defects and all of our damage. Jesus, you chose to love us and you didn't just choose to love us. God, you didn't just save us from ourselves, but you saved us to something to be able to live differently, to be able to have a new family trait, to be able to experience the life that comes from surrender to Jesus. And you do that freely, even though it cost you your son so that we could win at life and have a new legacy and a new heritage in Christ. And I pray for anyone watching who today wants to say yes and surrender to Jesus. Maybe if you want to click the button um, on our um, online, or if you're here and you want to speak to someone like Kyle after um, church in person, if you want to say yes and surrender to Jesus to be adopted, you can do that today. It is so easy. God, thank you for loving us so that we can have the freedom and courage to experience change so that we can win with our families. This is our hope and our prayer in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, amen.